Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 29, and this is what it says. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman therefore said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said to him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. You worship that which you do not know. We worship that which we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes... He will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all the things I have done. This is not the Christ, is he? Pray with me. Jesus, may we experience your presence, not one day, this day, this day, and, and be changed by it. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. A little while back, I was watching football on TV. And that's when my daughter came. She plopped down on the sofa next to me, and she said, you're watching football now. 
that might not seem extraordinary, but for my daughter to know the difference between football, baseball, and basketball, that it was a pretty extraordinary moment. Uh, I was really proud that she knew that she could care less about sports. And I said, yeah, watching football. And that's when she said it. She said, is this the one where Harry Potter steals the golden snitch? Well, <laughs> that's her way of saying, I really don't have any interest in watching this. Is it okay if we watch something else? I understood the ask. It was put in her terms, but I understood the ask. And I was glad to share that time with it. We went channel surfing, and we came up on Undercover Boss. And I, I don't know if you've ever watched that show. I don't even know if it's still on or not. Uh, that was, I think that's probably the only time I ever watched it. But every episode, my understanding is about the same. It's where the CEO of some big company goes undercover. He, they give him fake nose, glasses, wig, whatever, mustache, whatever it takes. And they, they take him to the most remote office in the company. It, he's in the town of Bug Tussle, and he comes on as an entry-level employee uh, who's trying to learn the ropes. And, and those that are teaching him have no idea that he's really the CEO of the company. And it's not until the very end of the, sh the episode where, where they, they fly those employees from Bug Tussle, the company headquarters, and, and the reveal is made, and they walk into the CEO's office, and he takes off the disguise. And sure enough, those who did the good things and were good employees, they receive more than they can imagine. Their wildest dreams come true. Those who were not the good employees, well, they're invited to seek employment in another company. And that's pretty much the way every episode goes. It's, it's that, that idea of, of going undercover. That's a story that has, has long attracted us. I, we tell it to our children from the time they're that tall. You know, the, the, that frog may really be a be a prince, so you, you be nice to frogs. Be nice to frogs. Or that ugly duckling really might be a, a swan. So be nice to ducks. Be nice to ducks. And, you know, it, and it, it, you never do know that what's undercover there is what you see is not always what you get. So, so well, it's older than just the stories of frogs and ducks. It's, it goes all the way back to the Old Testament, the beginning of the Bible. Abraham. Abraham, he's sitting out by his tent, and, and three strangers come by. Good hospitality says, give them water and give their camels some water too. But Abraham, he doesn't just give them water. He gives them milk, and he gives them a little bread and water for their camels. And, and it turns out that it's not three strangers, that it's two angels and God. And God tells Abraham that what he's always wanted what he's always asked for, that he's going to have that son. And it's not just going to be a son that's important to him, that, that it's going to be his son and his children and his children's children and his children's 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 children that will be that, that God undercover in the world. And that's the way that he'll reveal himself and reveal his plan through this son and, and this family throughout the generations. And it's right here. It reaches its focal point right here when Jesus comes to earth. The Gospel of John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that's when he says, it, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That God's gone undercover through, through Jesus. He's put on teeth, hair, and eyes, and he's walked out into the world. And, and it's not just a one-off that he's ushering in this kingdom for those who have eyes to see. A kingdom that's, that, that's right here in our midst, and it, it comes here on earth, and, and it comes in heaven. And, and for those who have eyes to see it and ears to hear it, and, and, and you, you can spot God undercover. God undercover, and, and story after story that Jesus tells is about the, the God, God's kingdom. That, that we're not, it's not a one-off story, that we're a part of something God started a long time ago. And this is one of those stories. 
Jesus goes to Samaria. Now, it may as well be bug tussle as far as the Jews are concerned, because you can't get any more morally remote than Samaria. Now, a good Jew would journey three days out of the way just to avoid the soil of Samaria. I mean, these are people who didn't take that covenant of Abraham seriously. They, that God revealing himself through his children and children's children, all that, nah, they, they it's, that's not what we're a part of. They were reprehensible is what they were. But Jesus shows up there and really what could be the most remote place in the world as far as a Jew, Jew was concerned. And he does something else that, that doesn't seem like something God would do. That here's a man that speaks to a woman. That Jesus says to the woman, asks, may I have a drink? Well, that's not something that men did in Jesus' day. I mean, not unless it was your mother, your daughter, your sister, or your wife. You just didn't talk to her. It is, is out of bounds. And this woman, she begins to give Jesus a little grief. She says, how is it that you being a Jew, and not just a Jew, a Jewish rabbi, how is it you being a Jew ask me, a Samaritan, for a drink? I mean, after all, aren't you people above folks like us? And that's when Jesus says, if you knew, if you knew, would life be different if we knew that it really was God undercover? I mean, would we, would we speak differently in our family if we knew that God really was sitting across the table from us? Would we speak any differently at school? Would we speak differently about our friends? Would we speak any differently in the workplace? to our employer, to our employees, about other people. Would we speak any differently? Would, would we act any differently? If we knew that the, the kingdom of God really had been ushered in here on earth and that God really was undercover. Well, Jesus says, if you knew, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, we'd ask. We'd ask We'd ask. We'd ask for, for living water. We'd ask for life, and that's the key. We'd ask for life, a life that has the, the power of forgiveness. And that's the first thing that I want to talk about. If we knew the gift of God, we'd ask for life that has the, the power of forgiveness. Pastor Scott Hosey talks about research that was done by the Templeton Foundation in conjunction with the University of Michigan. And what this research was trying to discover is what the attitude of Americans had toward forgiveness. They discovered that about 75% of the people in the United States understand that they've been forgiven by God, that the, the slate's wiped clean. About 75%, whether they attend church or whether they don't attend church, about 75% understand that, the, that God's forgiven them. The surprise for me came when about half, half weren't certain that they had forgiven others. Well, we have a tendency to, to, to separate out different parts of theology, and, and, you know, we say, well, forgiveness is one thing, and Love, well, that's something else. And, but when Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, I think that's exactly what he was talking about. That the same forgiveness that we allow ourselves, that that I apply also to the neighbor, to the one that, that hurt us to the one that may have betrayed or said or harmed, that 
the forgiveness doesn't just apply to us and you know me and Jesus got a good thing going it's that that it, it applies to others as well that it's a respect that's given before it's earned it's love that's given before it's earned and that's what Jesus does right here in verse 21 it's Jesus has already uncovered where this woman has been what's what she's done, what's been done to her. But in verse 21, Jesus says to her, woman, believe me. And the word woman in Greek right here is guni. And guni is the same word that he uses to his mother in the previous chapter at the wedding in Cana. It's the same word for woman that he uses to his mother from the cross. When he says, woman, behold thy son, it's, it means a special lady. It's a, a term of respect, of endearment. It's not disrespect at all. Jesus know what, knows what she's done and where she's been, and he offers respect. Respect. Forgiveness, well, that, that, that power to forgive and to receive that forgiveness, well, that's power we don't have on our own. It's why Jesus gave his life on the cross for you and for me to, to take all those things that would destroy us and to take away their power. He nailed it to the cross for you and for me to take away its power, not just for us, but to take away its power where we can forgive others as well. It's not just about being nice to frogs and ducks. It's respect. It's the power of forgiveness. If we knew the gift of God, we'd ask for life that has the power of forgiveness. Second thing I want to talk about this morning, if we knew the gift of God, we'd ask for a life that has the power to change. For a life that has the power to change. Bruce Larson, in his book, Ask Me to Dance, talks about a woman that was in his church. He describes her as a woman that had such a sparkling faith that it was the living water of her spirit that flowed out of her soul to people all around her. She was from another country, and, and he had invited her to go with him to a, to a seminar about evangelism. Well, there on the table, they had pamphlets that were spread out, strategies and demographics of, of, of how to, to share the gospel to the, the, the people that were unchurched in the community. And, and during the seminar, one of the seminar leaders turned to this woman and asked her. He said, uh, what was the reason that the church was so important in her life in her home country? Well, she felt intimidated by the crowd, and she, she kind of stuttered and stammered a little bit. But then when she began to speak, she said, Well, we never gave pamphlets to people because we never had any. She said, We just showed people by our life an example what it is like to be a Christian. And when they can see for themselves, then they want to be a Christian too. The power of a changed life. They just showed people by our life an example what it's like to be a Christian. And it's not a power that we have on our own. It's why Jesus rose from the grave, to live his life through you and me. That it's, that it's God undercover, that he's taken on teeth, hair, and eyes, not just in Jesus, but in, in you and me. That he rose from the grave to live his life through us. That his chosen, his chosen residence is you and me. 1 Corinthians 13, 3, 16 says, Do you not know you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? That you're the temple of God. You're the teeth, hair, and eyes that God goes undercover here in this world. And it's not just about being nice to to, to the frogs and ducks. It's about a power to live a, a changed life, 
a life that's, that's stronger than just our wants. It's power. Where the risen Christ lives his life through us. It's power. A power to change. The last thing that I wanted to talk about this morning is if we knew the gift of God, we'd ask. We'd ask. We'd ask for a life that has the power of peace. When I was in college, I got to be good friends with a fellow named Ted. Ted was a little older than I was, and he had graduated before I did. He was out. He was a high school teacher, so he had summers off. Well, starting in college, we were always going on adventures in the summer, either backpacking in the North Georgia mountains or maybe at Cumberland Island or we went to Mexico together. Later on, he got a Fulbright scholarship to, to Finland. We went backpacking around Finland and even took a train into the Soviet Union. Um, if, if, all the way into my 50s, Ted and I stayed close, and we were always going on different adventures together and doing different, different things together. And uh, I knew that that it was a problem when Ted called and said, I'm sick. He didn't mean he was just a little sick. He, he didn't have long to live. And I knew that I needed to get up and visit him as often as I could. He lived in Flat Rock, North Carolina. And I'd go to visit him fairly often over the coming year. And, and while he was undergoing chemo, he and I would swap stories. Stories about adventures we'd been in, uh, tight spots we'd been in, tight spots we'd gotten out of, people that, characters that we'd run into in, in our different travels in different places, and we'd spend a lot of time laughing, sharing those stories. We needed to also share stories about people that I'd heard him speak of before, that I, but that I didn't know, boyhood friends of his. One of them was a fellow named Danny. Ted told a story about he and the his friend Danny, they were about eighth or ninth grade building a fort out in the middle of the woods. One afternoon while they were building the fort, Danny asked Ted, he asked him, he said, hey Ted, have you ever asked Jesus to make his home in your heart? Well, Ted didn't really go to church, so he didn't really know what Danny was talking about. And he said, no Danny, I don't believe I ever have. And that's when Danny said, well, I did it in church this past Sunday. I asked Jesus to make his home in my heart, and it, it's made a big difference this week. And then Danny didn't just leave it there. He said, you know, you can do it now if you want to. And Ted, here, here Ted, more than 30, 40 years later, well, he has just a few days left. To live. He's remembering this story, and he's, he says, you know, I asked Jesus make his home in my heart that day and he said that made all the difference that made all the difference you know there's some things we don't receive until we ask that what Jesus did on the cross was to forgive you and me but he's not reluctant to give us the forgiveness it's that we're reluctant to receive it until we ask well, Jesus rose from the grave to give power to you and to me. It's not that he, he's, he's reluctant to give us the, the power that will change our lives. It's, it's, we don't receive that power, well, until we ask. And as long as this life is all about just being nice to, to frogs and ducks, we're never going to need to ask. But when it's about life that's full and abundant, a life that has power through the good times and the, and the horrible times. That's when we ask. That's when we ask, and, and that's when peace is given. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests there's the ask. Let your requests be known to God. 
And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That when we ask that Jesus stands guard of our, of, of our heart and our mind, that He's the sentinel that gives us peace. A peace. A peace that comes when we ask as He lives His life undercover inside you and inside me. This morning it may be that you've never asked. And I want to pray with you that now is the time that you do ask. Pray with me. Jesus, there may be some folks listening right now that have, have never asked you for forgiveness. It might be that they, they've heard about it, they've been in church all their lives, but they've never asked for that power of forgiveness, that gift for your forgiveness. Yes, for them and, and your power of forgiveness to forgive others. I know you have that power. The power of a transforming forgiveness. This day, this time, I ask that we receive that power. Maybe that there's some that, that are listening th this morning that they don't know that because they've never asked. They've never asked for the power of a changed life, for, for you to live their, your life through them. Ah, they, for a long time, they might have been real nice to the, the frogs and ducks around them, but... They've never asked for a changed life. And they've never received. Lord, I ask. I ask that the, that the power of, of your Holy Spirit begin to live now, this day, through their lives that, that they be transformed. And they begin to to live life in a different way, a changed life, a transformed life. Lord, it may be that there are those this day that have never asked you to make their home in, in their hearts and that they've not known peace because they've never asked for you to guard their heart or their mind. They've never known that peace that surpasses comprehension. And you give it freely to all who ask. May today be the day of ask that we receive a life full and abundant, the life you intended to live through us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online, my hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it.
Thank you for joining us.